Hello, everybody, and welcome to this next session um, where we're going to be looking at the next five years of payments. Um, it's really going to be drawing on many of the themes that we've been talking about um, over the course of today. Um, and indeed, five years feels like a very long time compared to what's happened in, in just the last year. I'm going to be joined in this session um, with some colleagues um, who I will introduce now, um, and uh, I will allow them to say a few words about uh, their role. Um, let me first bring on uh, Bensi Aviv from Amdocs. Hi, Phil. Hi there, Bensi. Nice to see you. Uh, I was listening to your Hi. session just now as well. It's all very interesting, very interesting topics. Perhaps you could give us a, 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 a 30 second or one minute view of what's the future going to look like? Is five years going to be totally different from where we are now? Well, that's a, that's a very tough question to answer. So uh, <laughs> I'll try to make some sort of a prediction here. I believe that um, if, if, the, if we learn something from COVID-19 is that we can't really predict what will happen next. So the, the intention is to create a capability to adjust better, adjust faster to anything that can, 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 can come next. Um, so I would say our future rely, actually depends on our capability to adjust and to be agile enough to deal with whatever comes next. Excellent. Uh, I'm going to bring in my next guest, um, Armin Egan. Um, Armin, welcome to you this afternoon. Um, how do you see the future? What Again, same question for you. In five years' time, is it going to be absolutely different or will, will it be recognizable from what we see today? I think that what we have seen in the previous discussions and uh, during this pandemic is an acceleration of the adoption of some of the changes that were being in the process by either the merchants, the payment networks, the banks. And, and that acceleration means that a lot of the technologies and the partnerships and the APIs that were brought together got uh, pushed to the market a little bit quicker. I think before we see the next wave of innovation is gonna take a little bit more time and there's um, some intricacies behind it. But I really believe that biometrics in one way is something that's going to change um, in the next five years and blockchain. Because mm -hmm. I heard earlier um, about cash. Today, we still don't have an alternative to that cash. And as long as we don't see it, there's still going to be there. And I think blockchain has a role to play there. Excellent. Um, I'm going to bring in my next guest as well. Um, Justin, Justin Ho from Amdocs as well. Um, What's your take on this? Where, where will, what will it all look like um, in the near term? Um, so, so, Phil, I agree with the pre previous panelists, um, especially on blockchain. I see a big future for blockchain, uh, certainly in emerging markets um, as, a, as a new way to pay. But um, my, take, my take on where payments is, go is going to go um, probably five years plus is I think payments will disappear payments as a concept will disappear completely. Um, if, if I was to, to, to look at a, a trend, I think payments will go the same direction as tel Tesla is with self-driving cars, such that I won't ever have to think about my payments at all. Um, the right payment method will be choosed for me automatically. Um, the, yep. the, 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 what the, merchant, the way the merchant wants to be paid uh, and the way the consumer wants to be paid will be worked out for me automatically on a win-win basis for the merchant and for the consumer. I shouldn't have to think about what payment method I, I need to use. I mm. will, um, it will be made for me in a, in a way that's most beneficial for, for my objectives. That's uh, really interesting. It's, it's like sort of the ultimate of frictionless payment. Let me bring in Brandon, Brandon Trollop from MasterCard. Is that your view as well? Are we going to see um, less and less direct involvement and, and more automation going on in the back? On Wi-Fi, but um, I, look, I agree and I sort of disagree in a number of, of points as well. I think um, I don't necessarily think that choice will be kind of made for us when we can make payments online or, or, or anyway in the future. I think it'll be down to choice in the consumer as well. I think it's it's important that merchants and and companies uh, offer choice. But it's going to be down to the consumer uh, in, in terms of going to how we do that. Yes, um, we can already going to make payments using voice. I do so with my Alexa device on a regular basis. I think the things that um, Amazon are kind of doing um, with uh, with just 
facial recognition is outstanding. So there will be choice, but I don't necessarily mm. going to think that companies will going to force choice down our throat. It's going to be up to the consumer as to whether or not they choose to shop in a certain location and pay in a certain way. Mm. Mm. And my last guest on this session, Dean, Dean Schwartz from Idemia. Um, what's your take? I'm sorry, you're last, you're last into the fray. <laughs> no, thanks, Paul. So I think a lot of key topics and trends that, that sort of I've identified and we've identified is very similar to what's already been touched on. You know, if we really have to summarize it, we're looking at where things are going. And it's about seamless payments, behavioral payments, the no-click payments. Um, but it will be about choice. It will be about choice through different channels. Uh, we then look at the IoT payments and how integrated payments, everything around us is becoming in, uh, sort of has access and has connectivity and payments are becoming embedded in more and more capabilities and technologies. And then mm. I, I have to raise the point as well around the blockchain or distributed ledgers and even CBDC, the uh, central bank digital currencies that are currently under pilot with a number of countries. And that's going to open up a whole new domain of new um, opportunities for, for, for the private entities and private organizations as well as government. Um, so do believe that regulations and governance around a lot of this will also dictate and drive where things will go. But it's, uh, it's all about consumer choice and consumer convenience. That, that's the big driver. That's an interesting point because I, I know a lot of the discussion um, uh, earlier in the day has been it's very much around the, the technology that sits behind um, uh, a lot of payments. But at the end of the day, these are consumers making a choice about how they pay for things. Um, is there an issue here around um, uh, financial exclusion and inclusion? That argument says so if you haven't got a phone, uh, if you haven't got a mobile, are you being excluded from some of these these ways of, of engaging in, in buying things? Or is this actually a, a red herring? That ultimately, it, it's something that is open to everybody. If I can can raise it, I think one of the key things that we look at is mobile I, penetration. I really hope my cool. audio. Ah, mobile penetration is much greater than the banked uh, today. Yeah. So there's still a large yeah. unbanked society that is currently needing to be serviced, and financial institutions themselves are looking for solutions through self-servicing kiosks. Um, looking at various ways where connectivity may not be available or connectivity may not be accessible. Um, you know, you look at, at technology today in terms of inclusion, just a few years ago, you know, M-Pesa was a great use case in terms of being able to provide mobile payments to an unbanked society. Hmm. Um, in mature markets, we have less, less of a challenge, but in terms of the more emerging markets, um, Mobile is still the key catalyst in terms of giving accessibility and smartphones today are, are more affordable than they've ever been. If I may add another point on top of that, because we started mm. talking about the unbanked, but I think there's a problem also with the banked population. The more you use payment processing, the more you are exposed, right? Because if you look at the typical payment history of an individual for one month, you can figure out their political political um, preferences, you can figure out if they are going, if they're having a mental a mental uh, checkup or mental uh, a treatment uh, once a month. There's a lot of information that is embedded into our payment history, a lot of information. We tend to ignore that because we focus on the social media, but look at it, look at yourself as an individual, look at your one month worth of payment. There's a lot of in the information embedded into that. So I would say that while we're focusing on the unbanked and how do we help them get access to the to the network and get access to the to the wallets uh, the payment solutions of the world we also need to pay attention to the fact that we are exposing a lot of information into this this is by the way my guess and i can't prove that that this is one of the main reasons why google and facebook and, and amazon are trying to get into that because it gives them access to very valuable information if you look at it from an advertising perspective the holy grail of advertisement is actually your financial information it's only it's the only piece of the puzzle that they don't have access to officially Today, they know who you are, they know your habits, they know what you like, but they don't really know where do you tend to spend your money. The moment that they get access to your payment history, it puts us in a completely different era, yeah. right? They, you're, yeah. you're become more exposed than ever before. So I say, let's also pay attention to the banked population because the more you use wallet solutions, payment social solutions, the more uh, things become digital, the more exposed you are. And therefore, I look at regulation as the means to control that, but also um, 
while we keep the 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 the, the, the frequent uh, frequency less um, capabilities, we also need to pay attention to the what what is actually done with our data. What is actually done with this payment information of mine when I actually make a transaction online? Mm. So I, there are I, I think these are yeah, Sorry. totally totally agree, Benji. I think that's that's the scary part about about my prediction. Um, when we have predictive payments, uh, if computers are going to be starting to make those decisions and choices for us, um, that means that they know that uh, uh, they know that this is the what this is what we do. This is how we like to pay. Um, it's it's still more information. So um, I'm a bit on the Elon Musk camp here that um, <laughs> we should be really frightened of AI and and where it might take us. So my prediction is not necessarily one 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 that I like. Um, but it, but it is a scary prospect. And to, to the earlier point about the emerging markets and financial inclusion, I think we we must remember that all of these mobile mobile payments really started in, in the emerging markets. They started with M-Pesa. They started with uh, with GCash in the Philippines. Um, so so that that those markets are really super re super have have been and are already very tech sa savvy. Um, so I, I don't see them being excluded. Uh, whether whether it becomes a two-tier market, um, that's an, another conversation. That's interesting. That it raises a couple of points, really. I suppose um, is there is there um, an issue around uh, uh, more security and the, the privacy aspect of this? Because I, I guess the more we're using. Um, mobile payments. Um, I suppose there's two things. One is um, uh, company will know more what I do. Um, but secondly, is, is there a, a need for an increased um, uh, awareness of, of security and, and uh, that, that side of things with so much yeah. becoming more digital? I definitely I, I, think so. I'd like to bring some. That, yeah, Sorry. I don't think we're doing enough in that, in that domain, if I may. I definitely think so. I think that it's going to get, we spoke about what will happen in the next five years. I think Obviously, there would be less and less cash and more and more digital transactions. And there's a there's a price to pay for for convenience, right? There's a there's a famous statement saying, if you're not paying for the product, you are the product. So so when it comes to this sort of sorts of uh, convenient based transactions or capabilities that you're given, um, you need to be aware of the fact that there's a price behind the scenes. You become a product. You become a you become a a source of data basically. And data mining is the, is the gold of the future, right? It's the oil of the next generation. So we need to pay attention to that. And when we build the solutions as software providers, as fintechs, we need to pay attention to that and make sure that the solution is built in a way that it can protect the information of the individuals using the platform. Um, that's my view on it. Um, I'd like to add a little bit of um, more depth into this in the sense where there's, there's a couple of things that were touched upon earlier uh, and the divide between the mobile and the bank, I think it was a really good one because I don't think that the lack of a mobile is going to be an issue in terms of accessing those new payment schemes because the human is very, it's full of ingenuity and it's um, full of creativity in finding solutions. And I think the penetration, as, as Dean said earlier, the penetration of mobile is higher than the one of banks. But to go to the topic of the data, and the collection of the payment data. I think there's something that we need to be very careful about. The banks themselves, when you use your card for payment, they have very limited visibility on what you're doing. You, they know how much you spend, they know where you spend it, but they don't have the details of what you're buying. The merchant has a lot more information about that. And there's a divide on who is collecting which data and where and this disparity yeah. that is happening. So what you are seeing now with the new technologies that are coming into play, we're going back to the old bartering of data basically 3d secure version 2 is not enough to have the frictionless payment but if you give me some more information i'll give you the frictionless so there's this uh, exchange of information and then when you look at this side of the data and how it is spread between different players in in, in the industry blockchain is a great solution for that because in a way it allows the self-sovereign identity models where you give back that um, data to the consumer or the user, and they have transparency and visibility on how it's being used by whom and where. And, and if you push that model a little bit further, then the person could find a way to monetize the data that is collecting about them. And, and regardless of the payment, uh, regardless of the bank, 
if I only pay cash and I go to the same merchant and I have my loyalty card with that merchant, they know a lot more about me than my bank will ever do. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, Brandon, I know you had some trouble get, um, get, getting on, on the system earlier. Um, what's your view on this? What, what, what do you think? No, I think I think I sort of I, I have to agree. I'd be I'd be foolish not to. Um, I think everything that sort of that we do kind of at Mastercard as well is based on on two fundamental principles. It's one is is user experience, and the other one is the security of the consumer's information as well. Uh, and we just look at that in terms of network tokenization. And I know that sort of I'm speaking very much from from a cards based world, but um, sort of guest checkout is still a, an enormous kind of factor on how we we pay for things. Kind of online, but there's an increasing number of us who are going to store our credentials online in, in sort of card on file or anything else as well. And and for that information, um, because it's out there in the internet, it needs to be secure. The, the the data needs to be far more secure, and companies have to kind of take that a lot more seriously as well. We just look at the number of data breaches that we've had um, in the last kind of few years. Uh, and so for us, I think at the last count, we have something like fifty something different products, which are all based on data security. Um, but I do believe that data belongs to, as was going kind to of said previously, to the individual. And if they have the ability to monetize that, then we're all for that as well. Um, so you know, so I, I think the way in which um, we're moving is certainly putting data in the hands of the consumer because that's who it belongs to. And again, comments made about the issue is the, the banks not knowing what you're buying. They know how much you're spending. Um, and that sort of under open banking will become sort of a lot more... Um, I suppose kind of prevalent in terms of availability of information with applicable account information service providers and payment initiators. It's, uh, yeah, I, it's, 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 it's going to be huge. And data is, is um, as you say, if you're not buying mm. something, you are the product. Can I just pick up on something you said there as well? Um, in relation to, to who, own, who owns my data as a consumer, um, I know ultimately I own my data. It doesn't always feel that way somehow um when i'm if if i might have to deal with uh some, some of the, the the big online platforms it feels like um uh it's it's not a it doesn't always feel like maybe a fair exchange it feels like somehow i i'm obliged to to share data in order to participate in um buying things or participate in that payment platform is, is that a fair view or, or is, it, is that um is that changing if, if I may, I, I think that the, we need to draw the line in between data that is collected for the purpose of improving my user experience yeah, and data that is actually sold elsewhere. Even, uh, you know, with the GDPR requirements here in, in, in Europe, yeah. whenever you log into a website, they give you this consent page, right? That you go and you see tens of different companies that you need to give consent to and you finally figure out that they don't really use your data only for the purpose of personalizing the experience. They actually sell this data elsewhere to someone yeah. else. And this is where I draw the line. I say, as long as the data is used to improve my user experience in the website that I selected to be in, <clears throat> yeah. it should be, you know, it's fine because it, it's, it, it, it's a trade-off between the, 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 the ease of use and the personalized experience. But the problem is that all of this data becomes, um, you know, it's a commodity. It's been sold elsewhere. Mm. It's been sold to tens of different websites that I will never visit, that I will never go to, that I will never try to buy anything from. And yep. this is where I draw the line. And I think it's not that we can block it all together and say, don't use my data. I think that to we most of us will be willing to accept the trade-off in between sharing my data and the personalized experience. But you want to make sure that this data is used for the purpose that it was it hmm. was intended to intended to, right? <laughs> if you don't yeah, find out that data being sold to to a third party you know, and then to a fourth and a fifth, and this is where I draw yeah. the line. So, uh, so and if I could to see uh, how many people are reading through these um, terms and, and conditions, and clicking the ones that um, are only functional, whenever you go to a website. Yeah. I, I personally that's do what I do. The that's what I do. <laughs> uh, but you have a choice, right? So you, you, you decide what you want to do. But there's there's this trade-off of convenience, um, data against convenience, and the one principle mm. is trust. And something was mentioned earlier, if, if you don't uh, pay for it, then you're the product. You look at the history of two advertising organizations like Google and Facebook. People trust Google a lot more. Um, and I think this it's not by chance, they spend a lot of time and money in terms of creating that trust and, and doing more transparency on how the data is used over there. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's the effort that they're putting in 
in place in terms of gaining the confidence and the trust of the people. But yeah, trust is a is a difficult it, word. It's a long time to win and quick to lose. <laughs> But, but Phil, to your point, I think there is is a, a really high degree of um, data ownership asymmetry at, at the moment. Um, and we generally have become the the, the frogs in the warming water. Um, we, we don't realize that we're, we are boiling. Um, and, and in certain domains that already exists. So whether it be in social media or, or so on. But so, so one of the more... Um, scary trends I'm, I've seen is recently in, in terms of payments is banks who are analyzing your credit card statements and looking at how you spend money and, and approving or denying a loan, a home mortgage, based on their assessment of how you are spending your money. So not just on your, your, your ability to pay based on um, normal normal metrics of, of disposable income, um, but being able to really dig into your data and seeing, hey, this guy's going to the pub all the time. Um, he's not that trustworthy if he's if, if, if he's going to be uh, drunk half the time. So Definitely. scary times. I mean, I'm, I'm in, the, in the camp of, of Aman um, that uh, the more this gets to a, an anonymized blockchain world, um, then... Uh, the, the better it is going to be for, for everybody's individual freedom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Although to, to have a counter to that, I think one of the key considerations yeah. in terms of a uh, anon anonymity is that you can't create necessarily the right governance structures around it as where you can around things like you know, GDPR and PSD2, specifically requesting consent from consumers. Um, and this is one of the debates that's going on in many circles today is what are those benefits around the anonymized uh, use cases versus the amount of fraud and risk that happens in those same scenarios? Um, so it's a definitely tend to agree. It's the governance structures about protecting the consumer at the end of the day is what's driving a lot of these initiatives. Yeah, f fair point, Dean. And so, so, so maybe it's, it's layering at that that level of governance on top of a fundamental architecture where your privacy is the first principle. Absolutely. Let, let's let focus a little bit back towards or towards sort of the, the, the front line of payments and uh, of, of consumers as well. What do you think are going to be the biggest hurdles? That, again, we're looking at, at that we all hand in our crystal balls and think, what's the next five years? What are the biggest challenges and hurdles that will need to be overcome um, over the coming years in order to, to take payments forward to make it more universal, um, make it more frictionless. Um, let me start with Bensi. Um, what, what's your, what, what are the biggest challenges? I, I would say, first of all, is the amount, the, the overwhelming amount of pay means, right? Nowadays, people buy Atrium, they buy Bitcoin, and they don't, they can't really use it to, 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 to make an online acquisition. They have to, to convert it into dollars and then they can. The thing is, that um, and it's growing. You see Google being active about it. You see Facebook trying with Libra and Calibra. So I would say that the, the next challenge would be the fact that there would be so many different payments, so many different possibilities to pay, you know, source of funds that um, that it will create um, a nightmare for customers. Therefore, what what Justin said before yeah. about me as a customer and the system chooses chooses for me is something that I now from now on I'll start dreaming about. Because if I look at myself, I have credit cards, I have debit cards, I have PayPal, I have. Uh, um, I have Libra, I, I have, sorry, uh, Fe, um, um, and, uh, Atlium, and I can't really choose what I'm going to use for, the, for any purpose. So I would say, in my mind, the challenge would be making a kind of a standardized, a global type of uh, an exchange, if you can call it that, um, an exchange platform that will help me um, manage my payments, manage my, my different pay, payment sources, if you can call it that. I can imagine it'd be a nightmare if, if every time I wanted to buy something at, at the corner store, it said, and which which of the 50 currencies do you want to pay in today? Exactly, um, exactly. What that, kind of currency do you want to use? What kind of... That's uh, never going to work. Yes. Um, yeah, Phil, if I, if I can sort of add as well, I mean, the, the sort of consumer choices is the great one, but also we work a lot with merchants. And again, it's down to kind of scale. So so we have experience in working in, in, in products with that are MasterCard developed or card scheme developed or even um, developed by partners. And adoption is the key. 
um, because mm -hmm. merchants themselves don't want to have the uh, means of payments that are cluttering up their payment pages that, that attract simply get a no consumers at all. And so we, we do find that the companies that we work with, um, we spend a lot of time talking to them about, well, what's the, your, I hate the phrase, but what's your USP? Why are consumers going to use this? And, and sort of from an scalability perspective, how are you going to get there? Um, because a lot of um, our experience is based on it, it can't be just as good as something else. It really has to be better. And we have, you know, MasterCard, Visa had uh, our own sort of scheme um, wallets essentially out in market. But those didn't really have the traction that I think anyone really expected or hoped. Um, but under EMV Co, where, of course, chip and pin and, and contactless payments is, has thrived, you now have schemes. And this is a point made, I think, by Benzie sort of earlier. Um, you need to have a global um, a global scheme, and sort of under so under EMV Co, we now have secure mode payments or secure mode commerce rather than the consumer facing brand being click to pay, which is tokenized credential on file but for guest checkout. So you do need to have a global scheme in place. And again, there's been a lot of there's been a lot of hype over the last few years on on cryptocurrency. And when I first joined Mastercard, that was pretty much all anyone ever spoke about. And from consumers we've spoken with in surveys that we've seen, um, allegedly, 40% um, of consumers say that they're going to be using cryptocurrencies sometime soon. I'd like to know, as a, the comment was made sort of earlier, where, because I don't know where I could use cryptocurrency today. But again, it's going to be down to regulation because consumers need to be feel safe and trust in the methods that they can obtain. Um, and so I think... You know, cryptocurrency, although it is here to it's here to stay with undoubtedly. But in terms of the speed in which it's adopted, it needs proper consumer regulation. As a consumer, it's not something that I, I look at and think, oh, I must no. get some cryptocurrency in my wallet when I when you, you only got to look at the headlines and today it's gone down half the value, tomorrow it's gonna to be up again. I don't know how much I wouldn't know how much money I've got. And that that's absolutely not what I want as a consumer. I need to know you know, dollars of dollars or pounds of pounds or whatever. Yeah, and, and, on, and, on, and on that point as well, you know, a lot of, a lot of, we, we have very, as you would imagine, very strong relationships with, with banks globally. Hmm. And from a consumer's perspective, uh, back down to kind of trust, when we speak with customers, both issuers uh, and consumers, they, people do trust their banks. And so from an authentication perspective, making an online transaction, be it on the web or on your mobile device or, or in app, to authenticate using a mobile banking app, that delivers the trust. And from a user experience as well, biometrics for a mobile banking app, that provides a, not just a, a great user experience, but has that sort of same security that we've always been aiming for. And again, MasterCard and everything that these schemes do is about user experience as well as coupling yeah. that up with their security. I think Interesting. you've touched on um, really good points there and, and a couple of them really resonate with me. Like the Envico example, I think it's a great one because it's showing the value of a uh, partnership and together uh, coming out with a product, giving um, this adoption, increased adoption is, is, is a really good one because then people have the choice to put the card that they want in it and it's a mm. unified platform. and the. And on the on on the security side as well, because at the end of the day, there was uh, on the card schemes side. If a card is compromised, then the whole industry is compromised, regardless yeah. of the logo on the card. And getting together in order to secure that was was a driver in terms of getting people to trust the cards um, for the payments that they are making, and it's going to be insured uh, if they have a bad experience. And and the banks, I think, it's not by by chance that they are trusted by the people is the whole regulation that they have to mm. follow um, mm. that actually created that environment. And in some places, people trust the bank even more than the government. Yeah, <laughs> probably true. Dean, let me bring you in on this. What what do you see are the next, the, the big challenges ahead? I, I think back, a lot of this has been sort of touched on. And, and, and the main thing for me and what we're seeing as well is definitely security and convenience. Um, you know, at the end of the day, when you look at this interoperability between all these channels, interoperability between all these payment options, um, and the governance structures of EMVCO, for instance, EMVCO 3DS 2.0, uh, the EMVCO drivers around SRC or click to pay uh, mobile or both, you've got your merchant tokenization, you've got your uh, um, network tokenization. These are all parameters that help drive the, the, the security and the interoperability within the ecosystem. 
I think what's happening though is if we look at a cards domain, it's very well structured, very well organized, and there's a lot of regulation drivers around it in terms of even self-regulation. Whereas a lot of the mobile payment domains, uh, leveraging off uh, new open banking channels, leveraging off new sort of initiatives that are, are whether it's UPI int integrated technologies or uh, other means, all of a sudden this becomes a whole new domain of both opportunity and risk. And I think the governance structures and interoperability of that is, is going to be a key factor in, in the success of how this all ties together. For instance, even cryptocurrencies, many of them are now leveraging off MasterCard, Visa, mm -hmm. uh, Discover, Amex's, uh, Rails to be able to get acceptance at the merchants. So it is mm -hmm. going to be an integrated ecosystem as opposed to an isolated ecosystem. Which makes data security and privacy even more important. That's right. It comes down to the heart of it, doesn't it? I mean, um, on one of the sessions I, I was I was on this morning, um, looking at um, consumer uh, and consumer uptake of, of mobile payments. One the the key thing that why do people use mobile payments? It's convenience and ease of use. Um, it, it's it's easier than getting a separate card out of my wallet if it's all in in my phone. Uh, it's certainly easier than handling cash these days. Um, what can we do to make that uh, an even more frictionless? experience for, for a consumer going forward are there things that is it always just going to be uh tap my phone or on a on a on a pad is it going to be always going to be snapping a qr code what are the, the developments we're going to see coming along that will make it even even easier for me to go somewhere anywhere anywhere in the world and buy the can of coke buy the newspaper whatever it might be you you probably have to look at what the definition of payment streams are because if you look at it traditionally, you've got your point of sale where it is the tap. So with the tap of a physical card or it's a virtualized card on your mobile, those yeah. are various options. E-commerce, mobile commerce has really moved that into the digital domain with a lot of regulation, governance and structures to support it. And acceptance has just been you know, a huge catalyst with COVID. We then look at sort of recurring payments, your everyday Netflix, your Disney Plus, where it's it's the cards or your payment terms have been uh, tokenized and now it happens without you even having to have any sort of manual interventions and then you have your iot payments which is all of a sudden now you've got all this data happening around you all this information happening around you and that information is now being used to be able to do our printer goes and orders ink cartridges because the ink is low um the pay as you use models and mobile mm. operators have been around for a long time applying that now it's moving into a technical domain. So it, it really depends on the different streams. It's not that one is going to be the only driver. It's going to be a, a meshed environment of all these factors. Hmm. Anybody else to pick up on that? What, what's going to make the, this, this a seamless, frictionless? I, I, I think that eventually, um, and it's the irony of the matter, because every organization nowadays that offers you a service wants to collect your data. And they all yes. collect data in different in different ways, right? Even uh, even the small moms and pop shops today that are digital, they want to know what you bought today and what you're gonna buy tomorrow. The th the thing is that the collection of the data, which is it has to happen, right? Um, eventually, and and we spoke about the trade off in between the data that I'm willing to offer in exchange to the convenience that will be given back to me. But I think that the challenge is the fact that every organization out there, every organization out there, is trying to collect my data. And that creates part of the friction because if I if I use this, uh, an example, when I buy a movie ticket online, and I used that example in the previous session, but in a different context. But when I buy a movie ticket online, eventually I would be redirected to a payment page, and then I will be redirected back to the to the to the merchant page to complete the transaction. This is friction. This is unnecessary friction, to be honest. I don't really need to do that, but. The fact that the bank still insists to process the payment because they know me better and they know my card and they know my history creates. The friction and I and, and I'm worried that this will actually become worse and worse and worse because as I said every company you know we speak freely about data being the 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 the, the oil of the future right uh, the gold of the future basically so mining data is important therefore more and more companies will do it even more and more and they will do it in different ways I honestly believe that the, the friction is not caused by technology it's actually caused by the fact that different organizations are trying to mine my data and therefore I will be redirected, I will move between pages, I will be sent to different pages to complete the transaction because everybody wants to get their share of my data, basically, because that's the essence of the service that they are providing. As long as we won't solve that problem, as long as there will not be any kind of a standard, and to be honest, we, we can't, you know, it, it will happen. That's 
my, 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 my wish would be that, or my hope would be, that at some point there would be kind of a standardized way of collecting my data. And therefore I can be paid. This also brings us to the point that once there's a standardized way, way of collecting my data and companies can get access to it based on my, pre, based on my uh, confirmation, I can get paid for it. Whenever someone accesses my data, I can get mm -hmm. paid for the fact that my data was accessed, even if it's a fraction of a cent, but still. It will, make, it, will, it will ease up the friction. I believe that the friction, as I said, is not driven by technology. No more. It was in the past, but it's not the case anymore. Mm. It's actually driven by the fact that different organizations um, right. that are part of my payment process are trying to mine my data. It's and the doing business it. models. Yes. That's so, interesting. I, I think it's also um, something different, sort of a different angle to this as well, though, is that when things become far too easy, governments can tend to step in as well and make things a little bit more complicated again. And, and, and by that, well, regulation does that sort of, I suppose. But you, you look at sort of the question, what makes things easier? You've got biometrics, you've got facial recognition, you've got behavioral biometrics, you've got all sorts of these different things. I think you know, under EMV 3DS, there are something like 200 and something data points that are collected or can be collected to kind of make the, the decision-making process a lot easier from an issuing perspective. But when things get too easy, um, you know, and you're subconsciously almost buying things, have you really kind of given consent to making that transaction in the first place? So having some form of intervention where you're consciously tapping on something, you know, you've done the identification, the verification, but do you really want this? And I think, you know, companies do also need to have a responsibility to ensure that people aren't buying things because it is super convenient. We do have a, um, a responsibility to ensure that, we are being responsible and not just exploiting um, sort of consumers as well. So it's different angle. We do need to make things super easy. We do need to make things super secure, but there's also a responsibility to ensure that people are spending what they really need to spend. Mm. Who makes that decision though? <clears throat> Certainly not me because it becomes, uh, yeah. you know, who's, who, who guards the guards. <laughs> that, that's a really interesting point. One of the slides I, I, um, was talking about in, in a session this morning um, was around what are what are the barriers to further uptake of mobile payments, um, and not surprisingly, it 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 was looking at um, the consumers talking about um, trust and security, and and the fact that they there was a perception and to a lesser extent a reality of the feeling of being overcharged for things. Um, um, the definition being that the, I've been charged for something that I didn't think I was going to be charged for. Now, there may be sort of a, a genuine mistake, uh, someone thinking they they didn't subscribe to something when they did or whatever. Um, but it's that same point of if if I feel I've bought something that I if, – if it looks like I've bought something and I didn't really give that permission, it, it's a trust issue again um, in, in the whole – payment system i suppose as, as a consumer i don't want to feel that i'm buying things that i didn't want to buy and it's exactly your your, your point about um needing to give a, a a reasonably frictionless but explicit yes to something uh, as opposed to a, a system saying well you probably want to buy this so, so i'll i'll make i'll make it happen for you. i'll do the transaction yeah. uh, there needs to be that sort of um um, Con yeah, consent. Over, over, consent. Over needs to consent be yes, yeah. <laughs> that, that's or exactly intent. right. Um, and and I think there's um, there's a very subtle nuance between the the intent and the consent, right? So w when we were talking about IoT payments earlier, there's this whole question of how do we get a payment or the transaction initiated by a machine that is not human driven. And, and that brings the whole discussion from earlier around predictive payments. So basically at the beginning, there's like a transition that happens where the system understands how you're using it and how you're consenting to it. But then at some point that intent consent becomes uh, predictive and happens in the background without mm. you knowing it. And and then comes the question of people trusting people more than machines. Even though the machines make less errors than humans, we are less tolerant towards them. And, and what happens when there's something that's being ordered by my fridge, which I didn't really need, or it happened just before I went on holiday or things like that. Yeah. So 
Yeah. How do you deal with these situations? And well, that's sort whole... of the algorithm, isn't it? it it's 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 that's right. It, um, you know, worst case scenario, if the if the most, if my computer computer can tell I really like the look of that car in the advert, and all of a sudden it turns up on my drive, I'm fifty thousand dollars in debt. Um, that that's really not that's going to dent my trust in system somewhat. Um, oh, well, you'll enjoy yeah, the that, joyride. The and <laughs> <laughs> I'll enjoy the argument with someone. Yes, so that's probably yes. true. Um, I wanted to pick up on on the, the topic of that we looked at in the the previous session just before this about um, the impact of COVID and the pandemic. Um, what's your view on how COVID has has it has and is changing the payment landscape? I mean, we all see changes in, around today, so there's far more contactless, there's less cash, certainly in in Western countries. Um, is this going to continue? Are we going to see an ongoing change in, in the, the payments landscape, sort of driven by or accelerated by, by COVID? So, um, let, let, let me give you some, some, some actual real-time data on that. So in India, um, we handle uh, the majority of, uh, of, of top-ups for telco um, payments mm -hmm. in, in, uh, in agents. So cash being received to top up your prepaid account. Um, prior to um, prior to COVID, that was still heavily swayed towards towards cash, um, and as COVID hit, it dropped off dramatically. I mean, for the simple reason that those agents were were closed. Um, once um, India got through its first wave, um, it flipped back the other way. So we have this kind of I think romantic notion that everything will change because we went through COVID. But what the actual data sh uh, shows is that the habits are really hard to change. And as soon <laughs> as, as soon as, as soon as the stores opened again, people went back to, um, to, to physically handing over cash and getting their top up. Yeah. Um, so, so that's just one, one data point I thought I would, I would is, throw is, in is, there. Is that, a, is that a geographic thing? Um, uh, I certainly see, you know, I, I'm sitting in the UK, which I don't know how representative we are, um, but uh, my perception is there's been a uh, an uptick in, in contactless uh, versus going somewhere and paying cash. I've got yes. cash in my wallet. I've had it in there for a whole year. I've not, you know, I haven't drawn the, the paper notes out because I, I haven't yes. needed to um, because it's become so much easier to pay um, contactless for, for stuff when I'm out and about. Yeah, and I think yeah. in the developed world, it's definitely, it's definitely geographical, Phil, because... Um, in the developed world, we we are really already accustomed to multiple payment methods. Yeah. Whereas in the emerging market, my de facto payment method was cash. The previous conversation was all about cash elimination. Don't get me wrong, that's going to happen. The speed and scale at which it happens, we, we see it directly in the data. It flipped really quickly back. So mm -hmm. it's not a done deal in, in those sorts of markets. Yeah, I mean... And but from from a card's perspective as well, in 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 Europe, I think mean, I think it's like eight in ten, so eighty percent of Mastercard transactions now um, in the physical environment are contactless as opposed to chip and pin, um, and that's that's been a huge jump. Um, and we also see that from, I think, digital adoption across Europe was around eighty percent before the pandemic, and after the pandemic, it was over ninety five percent. And again, you know, people can run surveys and, uh, and the vast majority, again, I, I hate quoting stats, but I do have them to hand. I think it's something like <laughs> seven, in 10 con seven in 10 consumers worldwide are saying that the shift um, to digital will stay as far as they're concerned with over half of those saying that they plan to move away from cash completely. Now, I don't know how true that is, but that's what the yep. survey says. I mean, I, I personally, like you, Phil, have not had cash in my pocket for a long time. Every now and then my daughter raids Sort of a piggy bank in the house but it's where are you even spending your cash just yes. use your yeah. you know your uh, your kids monzo card or, or whatever so um yeah mm. it's been a huge shift part, and i think yeah. it'll, it'll part stay of that, as well part of that is part of that is also the 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 transaction level that you're allowed to do contactlessly has yeah. come down and gone up as well so i can i can now spend a, a bigger sum but i can spend 50p in, in the uk uh which was never the case before mm. I, I'm afraid we're rapidly coming to the end of our time. Um, let me give everybody the, a last 30 seconds just to sum up where they where they think uh, the future will be for payments. Um, let me start at the top of my list as usual. Bensi, 30 second roundup. What, what's the future hold? 
as I said, I think um, we'll see a lot of investment into flick, uh, into creating a seamless experience to customers. I think that yep. we have a lot of challenges to be dealing with. We spoke about data, we spoke about technology, we spoke about, we also, we didn't cover the, the international remittances. We covered it in the previous session. So the possibility mm -hmm. to transfer money in between countries, which is extremely difficult nowadays, yes. uh, should be resolved. So the way I see the future is that we will, this will become a real global e economy, right? That people would be able to make these transfers and payments in between countries while keeping in mind that uh, we need to protect our data and we need to protect ourselves from uh, fraud fraud uh, fraud trans fraud based transactions so i'm excited about it to be honest i think covid-19 with all the difficulties and all the bad things and a lot of bad things one of the small things that uh, came out of it was small the small side <laughs> uh, small yeah. that uh, it's it's the acceleration of the understanding that digital uh, payments are the this is the face of the future i think that's right armen yeah. let me pull pull you in for that the last overview from your, your perspective? Um, I, I think I kind of agree with a lot of things that were discussed um, during the session. I, I think that there is going to be a reduction in usage of cash. I don't think it's going to go away. Um, none of any of the payment um, instances <laughs> that we have have ever disappeared, right? We still do bartering. There'll be a long um, tail of cash. <laughs> yeah. The, it, but it's it's going to be significantly reduced in terms of the, its its usage, and and, and I see okay. that happening every day. And okay. and the predictive side of of the payment to add another layer of convenience, and the self sovereign identity, which is going to allow people to get control on their data and providing transparency on how the data is used, mm -hmm. is going to be um, is going to be Excellent. a cyber. Justin, your um, your, your, so your last this, piece. Yeah, so for me, very similar to Am Amin, um, for me, it's about uh, being able to be um, in control. Um, blockchain, to me, is the architecture that does it. I think the next Gen, Gen Z is is going to be to totally comfortable with it. They are, are less um, tied to an institution. Yeah. Um, so we as institutions will need to adapt to that. Uh, and then predictive predictive payments. Um, choice choice is ex exhausting, um, and uh, let's let's simplify that. I think there's another whole session there on on, on predictive payments. Brandon, um, over to you for the last last input. Yeah, look, I agree with with everyone. Um, very easy from my side of things, but I think as well we as an industry have a um, an obligation to focus on financial inclusion. Look, there are still 1.7 billion adults out there who are not banked um and i think that's where we can need to focus on the future using mobile technologies we can draw in almost a billion of those um into the financial mainstream and i think that's where the future should also be focused on so not just about commerce but bringing people into this as well to create a bigger i suppose a, a, a digital um uh a digital class if you like yeah I like that. That that's interesting. And Dean, the last, the, the very last words from you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Paul. So I think again to support everything that's been mentioned in this discussion and it's all highly pertinent and, and prevalent. I think to be honest, it comes down to you know, security of the transactions, the consumer choice and consumer behaviour driving the success factors. Because technology is not the inhibitor. There's a lot of technology out there. It's mm. it's the adoption and the interoperability of it that will that will be the key success uh, factors. And then again, back to privacy, uh, the data security, yeah. consumer security, and then the intent and consent around that. That's what's yeah. going to make it a very interesting payments domain coming forward. That's fantastic. Gentlemen, thank you all very much for a very interesting and wide-ranging discussion. I think we've touched on many things here that can be the subject of, of many more discussions if we only had the time. Um, <laughs> so I will hand back to our, our, uh, our moderators to, to close up and thank you all very much indeed. Thank you, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye now.